Welcome, everybody. We are back for another Wednesday of the Live Twist podcast broadcast. We have a guest host tonight who's going to be helping out, and uh, Sarah Treadwell. Uh, she's. I'm, I'm going to tell you all about her in just a moment. But you know, as we as we do the usual, I want you all to know that this is a live broadcast. So any technical difficulties or you know mistakes or anything that we have to kind of go, oop, 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 you know, back up. Those will get edited out of, edited out of the podcast for later. Like this stuff that I'm saying right now, it's not going to be on the podcast. Uh, and if you want to subscribe to the podcast, that's out there on all the podcast places. But for those of you watching live, hello, I see you in the chat rooms and I see you in our discord. Welcome. And we are ready to start the show. Y'all ready? Are you ready? You ready, Sarah? I'm ready. Yay! Okay. All right, everybody out there. It is time to begin the begin. Starting the show in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 958, recorded on Wednesday, January 31st, 2024. Why is the ocean venting? It's not like Justin, really. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your heads with muscle bots mouse squeaks and lost city vents but first disclaimer 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 i disclaim before i proclaim this show is not the same even by name as we try to explain in another frame and may go against the grain not seeking fame never in shame food for your brain so let's all exclaim it's this week in science Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. Hello, happy day of science, everyone. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. Tonight, we do not have a Justin, we do not have a Blair, but we do have a guest who I will introduce to you in just one moment. Thank you so much for joining us. I see you out there. I'm so glad you're here for another week of science. I have a bunch of science news stories involving genomes and muscle bots and mouse squeaks. And I would love to introduce you to our guest tonight, Sarah Treadwell, a science communicator who focuses on astrobiology, but is well-versed in many other things. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. This is so exciting. Honestly, I have to, I have to say big thanks to Graham Lau from Ask an Astrobiologist, the podcast, uh, because I reached out today realizing that I had no other co-hosts for the show. And it was a scary moment going, who, ah, where do I go? And I reached out and Graham was unavailable, but he was able to connect me to Sarah. So, and thank you. This is last minute and amazing. So thank you for being here. Yes. Thank you, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Um, so we'll get into a lot more discussion with Sarah into the show about what makes her a space case, <laughs> what <turn> what got her interested in astrobiology. But first, as always, we're going to dive into a few news stories and talk about what is this week in science. And as we jump into the show right now, I want to remind all of you that if you have not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can find us broadcasting, live streaming, weekly Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Pacific time on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. Facebook. All those videos are there. So if you are subscribed and hit the little notification, you can catch us live or watch us whenever you want. We're also a podcast all over the podcast verse and uh, just look for This Week in Science. If you are curious about other aspects of the show or just can't remember all of this information, head to twists.org and that's where you can find all these links and all this stuff. <sighs> but that's the spiel. Now it's time for the science. Okay, diving in. 
My first story for the evening tonight has to do with mapping genomes. And we've been talking about mapping genomes for a very long time on this program. Uh, a long time ago, the Human Genome Project, you know, it took 13 years to map the entire human genome. And that wasn't even the most accurate map of the human genome because of the methodologies that they used. And we've been mapping other organisms over the decades since this technology of sequencing and splitting up the genome into little tiny puzzle pieces that then have to be fit together in just the right way could be done the most efficiently. Um, it's kind of like going from like the little two-year-old puzzles where it's the big blocks to like the really complex thousand piece puzzles that have tiny little pieces and a lot of just one color. This is where we are now. And uh, researchers who just published in Nature Biotechnology, they published their genomes, which are the big news is more accurate and they were more efficient. So instead of years or months to be able to get these genomes, they were able to get the genomes in days. I hear a puppy dog. <laughs> That's <is> good. <laughs> His name is Hubble, by the way. <laughs> I need to refrain from going Hubble. <laughs> uh, no, if you if you just have to, you know, bring Hubble in, you know, for a little love. <laughs> <laughs> we won't complain. Uh, so the exciting part of this uh, this assembly is this new pipeline that they've developed. And so they published just this last week in Nature Biotechnology, and the paper is Scalable, Accessible, Reproducible Reference Genome Assembly and evaluate, Evaluation in Galaxy. What's Galaxy? Galaxy is an open access, open source software that is available to researchers and people in the public online. It's part of the Vertebrate Genomes Project, which has been running for a good long time. And they are trying to map 70,000 genomes. Like, that's the goal, is to map 70,000 species genomes uh, for the vertebrate species on the planet. They're using the Galaxy infrastructure and the public instances to allow the collaboration. They allowed uh, This allowed them to compare the genomes that this new publication was developing against what had already been assembled. They started with the zebra finch, which is my favorite little tiny bird. You know, I spent a lot of time with Tania Pigia guttata in my graduate years. And uh, it's it's one of the many vertebrate species that have been previously sequenced. But with this assembly and this new uh, this new research, the researchers involved in this are able to actually make available the software, the new algorithms, and the new databases that are hopefully going to enable what will one day be an understanding of the, the multitude of genomes, vertebrate species specifically, that are present on Earth and uh, be able to actually compare all of them in a much more accurate way. And the big issue with this study is that it needed to be scalable with the time it takes to sequence, or it has taken to sequence vertebrate gen genomes, historically, the idea of getting to 70,000 would take decades. I mean, oh. <laughs> centuries. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was going to say, this is, um, this is definitely the kind of the way that things are moving with uh, data repositories and being open source and having this accessibility for researchers to be able to compare and uh, replicate. Um, I just was in Santa Barbara doing some training on um, R coding for Arctic data repositories. Oh, so ooh. this is so in line with that, that same sort of thing. I mean, the, the microbial life and the, the other, I mean, this is stuff that we know is there and we can see, look, it's a bird in a tree. Let's, you know, take a feather, let's take a, a skin cell sample and see what's in it. But like so much of the Arctic stuff and the stuff in the water and the, the sequencing of the unknown, it's like, what is there? Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's real investigative digging. But 
But this is exciting because it hopefully will actually allow this kind of sequencing to scale and move forward in uh, in a way that will actually get us to lots more genome sequence sequences in less time and more accurately. They're using um, also the, uh, uh, what is the name of the group that I just blanked on the company that is, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the company, but it is a very, uh, <laughs> it's, it's one that is uh, very well known in the space of um, chopping up genome sequences and being able to put them back together. And, and I can't know, I don't know why I'm not remembering that right now. <laughs> anyway, little tiny puzzle pieces, and that's what they're using. Um, do we move forward into uh, robots? I, I'm I'm all for robots. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to my lack of memory. No, no, um, no you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's all good. It's okay. Um, how do you feel, Sarah, about r robots in general? The idea of robotics and how they work. This is a, this is a you're asking the right person. I actually own <laughs> uh, a small robot. Um, her name is Sagan, <laughs> and it's a uh, it's a following robot that uses some AI technology to track the person that it's programmed to follow in that moment, mm. and it maintains a certain distance, and it can carry up to twenty pounds, and it's on two wheels, and you, um, yeah, just did use you it. steal <laughs> this robot from NASA? <laughs> no, I did not. I, I did uh, no. I I you know, admittedly saw an ad for it on TikTok. And I was like, "Ooh, do I need a robot? No, but do I want this robot? Yes. Yes. So it's a it's it's called a, a Gita bot. Um, so yes, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of robots. <laughs> well, in in space exploration, we know robots are going to do the work for a while, uh, for for a while in other places where humans cannot be. They're mm -hmm. going to collect samples. They're already on the surface of Mars. We've got robots going out all over the place." But one of the questions is, you know, how do we make robots more efficient? And how do we, uh, right now, it takes big batteries. A lot of them have to be plugged in. Uh, the stuff that we're looking at at the really fancy robot companies where they show their robots doing dances and backflips <laughs> and stuff. They're we not, know who they are, yes. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, pro, they're programmed and they're only working for short periods of time. These are not bots that are just like, hey, I can hang out for a whole day and then, you know, go to sleep. But what if robots had a uh, skeletal muscle? What if they were able to function based off of the same biology that vertebrates, mammals, humans use? Yeah, the be. I mean, I mean, are you? Um... This one, I guess I didn't read f farther along in this paper because I've read all of these ones that you sent. So, like, are we talking like three D printing? you know, uh, human kind of parts and putting it into a robot? Is that kind of the proposal that's moving here? It, no, this is not 3D printing right now. It is culturing skeletal muscles and creating a uh, actual muscle cells that work in the same way that, uh, say, a, a, a group of muscles working together in a, you know, a myocyte working with other muscles in a muscle bundle to be part of a larger muscle organ um, to move a limb. And these researchers have, it's, this is not, this is not taking over the world yet, everybody. I'm just, <laughs> I just letting you know. Right now, they've got these little teeny tiny robot legs made out of plastic pieces that were probably 3D printed and with <laughs> muscle cells connecting the tops and the bottoms. And they have been able to energize those muscle cells with electrodes and uh, alternate the on, off, on, off, on, off, and create a structure, which is like walking. Yeah. So and this is like Frankenstein, but yeah. real life. <laughs> yeah, but only if these little, little robot legs are in a cellular nutrient bath like they can't come out of water <laughs> because the muscles dry out and then they shrink because the cells are dying. <laughs> Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, so you're wondering, how do I feel about that? Like what, like, how does, so, yeah. 
it's where would uh, where this will go eventually is definitely further than where it is now. But oh, for I, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know that it's it's a. I think this is going to be at least from a science communicator perspective. This might be a hard sell for a while. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> like I think this might freak some people out. Um, and by some, I mean a lot of people out. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's a, it's a very simple design, and uh, you know, it's right now they're sticking electrodes into the water to enable the movement. Um, I'm gonna share this, uh, this from the journal Matter, where that, where it's published. Um, you know, we've got these little electrodes in a nutrient water bath, and when they turn on or off, the different legs move. It's it's not beautiful movement. It's not, <laughs> uh, it's not a ballet dancer. It's not, <laughs> but it is the beginning of uh, of possibly leading to lighter weight robots that are made of uh, maybe more efficient materials. Uh, we know biology works very well. So, um, you know, can this turn into uh, something more? Will they ever be able to get past this need uh, to have the robot muscles in water or a, a nutrient bath? How, where is it going to go from here? But it's an interesting start. 3D cultured muscles for <laughs> robots. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I'm a I'm a fan. I think uh, I think robots always deserve the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> it's the uh, the programmers that are <laughs> yeah. maybe more problematic. Yes, I would agree. Or the that's data. Just, that's an interesting twist, though. So, and I have a whole yeah. train of thought going on, on that. But uh, there are some other stories. So <laughs> we do know. have more stories. Yes. Uh, Eric Knapp in the chat is saying, wasn't there a documentary on this kind of thing called Blade Runner? Yeah. Yeah, we saw how that worked out. Hopefully science fiction will uh, help us move into the future better. All right, everybody, if you've been out at night after the sun goes down, the lights come on outside, and you've probably seen clouds of insects, moths, gnats, other other nighttime insects come and gather and seem kind of chaotic flying around those lights. And everybody says, oh, it's just moth to a flame, right? It's just, they're just attracted by light. But why are they attracted by the light? And why do they fly in the way that they do around those lights? Some researchers just publishing in Nature Communications, they have uh, published their work this last week, which I find fascinating. A researcher was like, oh, okay, how does, what, why do they fly around the lights the way that they do? Why doesn't it seem like normal flight? This is a weird behavior. And they put a moth to a light in the laboratory and realized that the moth was reorient, reorienting. So it's back was to the light. It, they're not coming up and facing the light, like as, as if they're, you know, worshiping it. They're, <laughs> they come to the light, but then reorient and their back goes to the light. And so they started doing a lot of really uh, high resolution, three-dimensional space models. Uh, they had, uh, the researcher says, I had let a large yellow underwing moth take off from my hand and fly directly over a UV bulb. And immediately it flipped upside down. They didn't know if they would be able to see this in the wild or not. And so they went to Costa Rica and did a whole bunch of experiments with lights and saw what the insects did and were able to determine that this is normal behavior, that the flipping around is what the insects, the night insects do because they think the lights are the brightest thing in the sky, which would be the moon or the stars normally. But because we have artificial lights, suddenly we have created this new bright source. But then they also are uh, trained by gravity. So the gravity of the earth tells them how to orient. And instead of orienting to the moon or the stars with their back to that, they are now orienting and trying to orient to 
this artificial light source. And in looking at the uh, these the light source and the the data that they got from it, they were able to actually um, model why and how and be able to predict the movement of the moths and that this it's not normal flight. It is specifically within this controlled environment. It's chaotic and it only occurs as a result of the artificial light and the combination of the gravity. But then they did this really neat addition to it because of reflected light, right? So they were like, oh, what if we have a light shining at the ground and, uh, and, and what's gonna happen to the insect then? Where is it gonna go? And they found <laughs> that they crash on the ground. <laughs> when oh. the light is shining at the ground, the ground becomes the reflective source and the insects get confused and they crash on the ground. But if the light is facing up, they are more likely to fly upward, right side up and normally. This is so like depending. the of the cat, like the memes with the piece of bread on the back and then it doesn't know which way to fly. <laughs> right. If you put buttered bread on the back of a cat, where it's just going to hover forever. Um. Yeah, never falling. Yeah, no, that's interesting, though, that, that the gravity is, um, you know, something that they orient themselves with, because, um, you know, we know that, you know, a lot of species use the magnetic, you know, properties of the Earth to know how to migrate and stuff like that. Um, so I guess that completely makes sense to me. Uh, and as an astronomer, I would definitely say it's very frustrating. Oh, my God, I'm going to have to take care of this dog in a second um, to Hubble, have we love you uh, <laughs> to have. Uh, these light sources because it does you know it not only messes up with your astronomy but it does it messes up with these animals and and these you know different the migrations and the bugs and and that that kind of stuff so yeah uh interesting study yeah and i what i what i wonder as they move forward with this research you know how it, will this help us with our urban environments how can it help us do new lighting design so that we aren't interfering as much so right now we have street lights come down to help mm -hmm. us see our sidewalks. But what if the lights were shining from the ground up instead? How would that, how would that uh, change the way that things worked? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah, it's interesting. And I don't know, pretty, uh, I mean, couldn't complain like studying a bunch of moths in Costa Rica. That sounds like a pretty fun job. <laughs> it sounds like a Sounds like a fantastic job, but who knew that these nighttime insects decide to fly up to the light and then turn their backs on it. And then flip on it. Yeah. <laughs> and then that makes them act all, act stranger than normal. Um, speaking of, uh, no, not stranger than normal, mice. I like mice. Anyway, terrible segue. Uh, <laughs> mice <laughs> communicate in many different ways. We've talked over the years about not just alarm calls or squeaks related to pain, but mice also have ultrasonic sounds that are very, very high pitched that allow them to communicate for mating and for other social communications. Um, and there are even some mice that we know sing and there are rats that we know to laugh. So there are all sorts of vocalizations that take place in the mouse world, researchers wanted to know if all of the same neurons in the brain were responsible for all of these vocalizations. So basically, across many species, we know that there's an area of mammals called the midbrain, periaqueductal gray region, and it regulates vocal production. And if you artificially stimulate it, then it causes a squeak in a mouse or it causes a person to go, ah, or it makes vocalizations in many different species. But how they're organized and all the different types of neurons that come through that periaqueductal gray region isn't very well known. And the researchers were like, hmm, I wonder. So they looked at a bunch of mice and they uh, blocked neurons in this periaqueductal gray region, the PAG region. And they determined that if they blocked these very specific 
when they when they blocked these neurons, it blocked the high ultrasonic calls, but it did not block the squeaks of pain or the alarm calls. So it's the real communication between the mice that gets blocked when those neurons are turned off, as opposed to like the, the ah kind of alarm or pain responses. Um, and there is this amazing video that I I'm going to try and share it with sound. So I hope it I hope it works out. Um, and in it, the researchers. Oh, did I share it with sound? I have to wait. Stop sharing. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make sure I've got all of the all of the things. Also, share tab audio. Yes, good. Okay. <laughs> Good. These are those technical difficulties. The technical things that we want to <laughs> make sure that we're working through. Yes. So in this uh, video, the researchers have a male interacting with a female before and then after these neurons have been turned off. And in the beginning, can you hear the high-pitched squeaking? Yeah. So in the beginning, these ultrasonic calls are the male calling to the female. And then the male and the female keep interacting. But after the neurons are turned off, the male is no longer making any sounds that can be detected. Hmm. Yeah. But they do still make the ouch, ah, noises, right? Because from an evolutionary perspective, that kind of makes sense, right? That's probably coming from a more survival part of your brain that's, you know, yeah. um, yeah, that reflex, reflexive kind of response, but interesting. And like, also the fact that we're like, yeah, and we turn off this part of the neurons. Like, what? <laughs> you know what, I mean? like, what? That's just so wild. That's just yeah, it's, so it's wild. amazing that they're able to specifically affect just certain groups of neurons. But this was able, they were able to also extend this to females. And so there's activities, the behavior still happens, but they're just silent when that area of the brain is turned off. And now it's, uh, you know, what does this mean for how brains are set up in social animals, the communication that takes place, and how the brain works to allow vocalizations at certain, you know, specific times or not. Yeah. So, yeah. But eventually, you know, I like the, we're just trying to figure it out for how it works in the mice. But of course, there's always the, well, maybe if we understand this in mice, we can look at how this affects and it might apply to humans as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Down the line. Um, and moving on from mice, um, let's talk about uh, enzymes and plastics. There's a lot of them. Yeah. You go to... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the single-use plastics are the ones that are uh, really problematic right now. Bioplastic polylactic acid, PLA, it's very often from a natural source like soybeans or corn or uh, potatoes even. And very often it's like, great, it's good plastic. Well, it still doesn't break down easily like all oh, the it's a polymer. That's what it is. They took right. a natural source and turned it into the polymers that make up plastics. So researchers public, publishing in Cell Reports Physical Science from King's College Lond London, they were looking at this uh, issue of, oh, okay, you go to the coffee shop, you get a cup of coffee, the inside of it is lined with the PLA so that the, you know, the coffee doesn't go through the paper of the cup and you can enjoy your, your coffee then you go throw it away. It goes in a landfill. It takes a long time to break down. We know that there are microbes and there are enzymes that could possibly help with this, but what if we could develop processes to use enzymes that are already in use in our uh, industrial processing or in our ma manufacturing system? And in this particular study, they have described a general route to retooling hydrolytic enzymes toward plastic degradation. And they used one specific enzyme that is uh, lipase B, and it's from a Candida Antarctica species. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's used in laundry detergent. So you have this enzyme being used on large scale very regularly. And in this 
study and this process, what they show is success in being able to get the enzyme very easily to a state where it will grab onto that PLA and tear, tear the polymer apart, right? It'll take the plastic pieces and rip them into the organic bases that they come from. And they show full degradation in 24 hours and conversion to monomers instead of the polymers, which are long chains, within 40 hours at just 90 degrees Celsius. So this is something that is within reason for industry, for our recycling, for the poten potential to be able to grab these things before they end up in a landfill or even as they go through a landfill and use these enzymes to, in, to, to make plastic re recycling better. More efficient. So, yeah. More, yeah. 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 And so we put less in the ocean. <laughs> and your laundry is really clean. <laughs> <laughs> now that was one of my favorite things, uh, learning in biology was about how, um, how, you know, microbes and enzymes break down things. And that's why now, you know, think of even just when I was a kid, you, you had these washing machines and you put your hot water in there and, you know, and now it's like minimal water and cool water and you get clean laundry and it's yeah. because of enzymes. Enzymes and are just, they are, they are really, they're what allow cells to function. They are really helping us move forward. And I mean, I'm excited about how artificial intelligence is, you know, these learning algorithms are going to enable us to identify more and better enzymes that will potentially, or even enzymes that we already have in in use that we can use to even, you know, better living through chemistry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Make our lives better. Science. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I, I really do hope that we can figure out the the plastic issue because that is one of the big ones moving forward. Yeah. I mean, that's a layered problem too, because when you're thinking about these biodegradable plastics, right, that come from corn or soybeans or stuff like that, there's also a problem in that too, that these huge scale productions of these crops to make these products and those monocultures yep. are not super great for the earth either. So it's, you know, it's, it's, to me, I, whenever I look at an issue, it's never it's never simple. It's never black and white. There's no like, here's the problem, and I'm just going to pull that problem out. It's always very nuanced, and there's it's a scale. So yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's one of the uh, the big problems and needs when it comes to science communication is getting past you know a history of teaching students that science is right or wrong answers, and actually. Educating, it, edging, educating people as to the nuances and the complexity of all of these issues and the systems that are at work on our planet within our society that make things work the way that they do. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's never black or white. No. <sighs> no. I mean, I'm watching for all mankind now. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I haven't, I really haven't actually gotten into that that much. So, yeah. I mean, I know I should, but <laughs> I... there's no shoulds. It's just if you do or not. <laughs> Or do or do not. Do or yes. do not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a very Yoda type saying. But anyway, okay, we have hit the first half of this show. And I just want you all to know that this is This Week in Science. We are running through the stories. And I'm so glad that you are here with us right now. If you enjoy Twist, please share with a friend today. Help somebody else to subscribe. Let them know where we are on all of the different platforms where we stream live and where we podcast. Also, if you really love the show and want to help us continue, head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link where you can join the Patreon community of supporters for Twist and you can choose your level of support per month, $10 and more, and we will thank you by name at the end of the show. There's also our Zazzle store, so you can hit the Zazzle link and take a look at some of our Twist merchandise. Many items have been created by hand, art created by Blair. So if you like science art in her Blair's Animal Corner segment, um, there's a calendar available. I mean, I know we're at the end of January, but there's still 11 more months to go. You have time. And there are many other things out there. But really, 
We thank you for your support. Thank you for being here. We really can't do it without you. We're coming on back with more This Week in Science, and it's time to reintroduce our guest for the evening. Sarah Treadwell is a science communicator who currently is developing a book and a planetarium show about the lost city hydrothermal field. What is this? We, we need to know more about this. <laughs> She's also working with the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science and the Ask an Astrobiologist podcast and pursuing a PhD in communications right now. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. And actually, I haven't really talked to many people about the book thing. Not that it's a secret, but I just haven't. It's been a little like kind of low key. So you heard it here first. <laughs> I saw it on a NASA bio. So oh, okay. it's on somewhere. It must be my scope <laughs> project, I think, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not a secret. It's just I don't I don't I haven't really like blasted it out there yet because it's still in the works. But yeah, no, thank you for having me. So uh, the planetarium show you mentioned the scope and that is funded by a NASA scope grant. Is that is yeah. that's what what's going on there? What is yeah. happening with that project? So the, the NASA scope grants are C grants for um, connecting subject matter experts to the SIAF teams, which is an initiative by NASA to um, kind of broaden science communication, I guess, in, in the best way to explain it. Um, there's a lot of initiatives within the SciX teams, but the SciX teams are different projects that NASA funds. And so I am partnering with Open Space, which is an open source um, uh, kind of data repository. And what they do is they are basically building the universe <laughs> and, um, and they're doing it to scale. <laughs> so it's it's like a, a software that you can zip around the universe and everything is to scale. And so when I tell people you can easily get lost in open space, this is not an understatement because if you know anything about space, it is really, really big. Um, and so uh, understatement. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so what they do to try to help people, because it's very easy to get lost, is they build these guides. And so say you're like, I really want to learn about all of the research and the missions we've ever done to Venus. There's probably a guide written for that. And so it will like guide you through the open space program. So it it's not you trying to figure out how to fly there on your own. And that's what they call it when you're moving around it. It's, it's flying. Um, and so uh, I was sitting in a meeting um, and open space was presenting and they were talking about a program guide that they had developed for astrobiology. And then they went on to say, yeah, but the only thing we don't have is um, going to hydrothermal fields under the water on Earth. And I was like, oh, darn, because I just sailed on a ship for two months that went over a hydrothermal field. And that would be really kind of useful for me as a science communicator. And so then I had someone in my comments going, oh, this is what a scope grant is for. And so that's kind of how that all came about. And so it's super exciting. Um, not amazing. only are we going to put the vent field in this software, but we're also going to build the ship in there as well to really connect the concept that it's, while it is, you know, a lot of NASA missions built in there, there's still so many scientific organizations that make the magic happen. It's not isolated in a vacuum. And so you often find these big kind of things have a lot of funding from different countries, from different scientific organizations. So I really wanted to bring that to my guide that I'm writing that, you know, it's not uh, an isolated thing to, um, you know, have astrobiology research. It, it, it takes everybody. And that's what I like about astrobiology is that it's not just biologists. Actually, there's even a joke within it that it's very few biology people. It's a lot of like geologists and chemists and planetary scientists. And, you know, uh, lot, lots of people make that happen. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, chemistry and physics before you actually get to life. And yeah. yeah, there's a lot of stuff that underlies all of it. So yeah, yeah. how do you get to the, the understanding of what could make life possible before that, right. you know, the chaos of ecosystems starts exactly. to evolve? <laughs> yeah. Which leads me to, you asked me, what is the lost city? And, and that's where, you know, I'm really excited yeah. to work on this project because I didn't set out to be the uh, uh, kind of expert, if you will, on the lost city by any means, but it has started to consume my life. And now I, I know this place very, very intimately. Um, and uh, to your point, basically the lost city is a place where 
many scientists think chemistry might have turned to biology back in, in history, not mm -hmm. this vent field, but this might be an analog to a system that perhaps this is where life may have gotten started because there are chemical reactions happening in this area that produce um, hydrogen and hydrocarbons. And so it's very feasible that this could be the place where maybe life got its foothold on Earth. And so that connection to space is that also many scientists think that therefore, if this could be happening on Earth, it could be happening on icy moons of like Jupiter and Saturn. So th this hydrothermal field, we've talked about uh, hydrothermal vents on the show before, mm -hmm. the black smokers, which are known mm -hmm. to be very hot in these upwellings of like volcanic activity um, that have a lot of um, gases in the hot water that allow nutrients for uh, microbes to be able to live and have these small yeah, these food, um, chains. Yeah. Yeah, food chain habitat, everything. How is this hydrothermal field different from just the black smoker? From all of them, these, yes. So this all is, of them, yeah. yeah why is it why is this them. significant? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just gave a really great introduction into how I, I have to explain this because I always have to first explain a black smoker and what that is and then why this is different. So this vent field was uh, accidentally discovered in 2000. Um, it was actually the second to last day of their cruise that they were just kind of scanning this. Actually, this is a great picture to show right now too. They were they were scanning this transform fault wall and kind of going up and down and moving a camera. And then it was spotted out of a side camera, these like ghostly white kind of greenish towers. And, um, and the arrow you see in the top corner there, it's pointing to where this is located in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. So this is basically a plate where the plates are splitting apart. The plates- Okay in that spot are pulling apart very, very, very slowly. And so it's allowing the mantle to rise up. So that, that map showing all those red spots, that's, you know, like a mountain under the water, but that's mantle rock coming up. So from... hotter it's, it's the, the, the plates are pulling apart. And so you have the, uh, the rising of, of the mantle, the mantle yeah. up but and pushing the crust upwards. It is. Yes. And this is yeah ultra ultra slow spreading i mean i think it's like one centimeter a year like it's super ultra slow spreading and um <laughs> it's, it's so it's slower allow... than like san, san andreas fault movement <laughs> yeah. <and> like... <laughs> right. yeah. exactly and so um what is happening is not heat from the the bottom of the earth the magma the you know the volcanic activity which is what the black smokers are are getting their energy uh, from this yeah. is actually the uh, mineral olivine is in the mantle and that has an exothermic reaction with the salt water. So it is when the salt water gets into that mantle rock, when it gets down into the cracks, it is having a, a chemical reaction and like it is creating like serpentinite. Serpentinite. Yes. Okay. So serpentinite okay. is a, I tell people it's think of like the crusty buildup of calcium on your faucet. It's not a great analogy, okay. but it's the best way people can think about it. Um, yep basically these big ghostly spires are the serpentinite. It's the, it's the leftover from this Oops. chemical reaction happening, but they're, they're actually producing heat from the exothermic reaction. So there's heat coming off of these big spires and you can see it. And that was one of the things that really jumped out at the researchers. They saw this like shimmery water coming off of these spires and they were like, they, it's so funny to read the original NSF blog post to it too. Yeah, this is, this video you'll see in the second shot, you'll see that water shimmering, shimmering. off of it. So that's off. Of, that's all the heat coming off of it. It's not cool, <laughs> but it's not as hot as a black smoker. So it actually allows microbial life to really thrive because most it's black It's not smokers, extremophiles. Yes. It, well, it, right. yeah, right. no, exactly. And so it's, you know, even at the black smoker sites, if anything gets too close to those vent fields they're gonna die it's way 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 too hot um but this is like much cozier for microbial life so there's sort of like almost like a snotty film <laughs> on these <laughs> on these uh, white vents and people call them white smokers which is a misnomer because they're not really smoking but um yeah the the idea is that this is a, a cozy place that has all the right chemical soup if you will that perhaps life got its foothold here 
And because it is driven by a chemical process, it could very likely happen on these icy moons of Jupiter and Saturn because this kind of reaction doesn't yeah. need a molten core for it to produce this heat and energy. It's doing it from a chemical reaction, not from the, the core of something. So um, the uh, a lot of the NASA missions now are specifically looking for this kind of potential of these vent fields being out there. So like the Clipper mission, which is set to launch this year, um, is going to try to fly through the plumes of Europa that's like spitting water out into space. And it's going to try to fly through some of this water to try to catch water samples as it passes through. And so hopefully on my expedition, we took water samples. Hopefully we can use that as an analysis to, you know, compare and see what we might be able to find. So yeah, I shared you with her. I shared a bunch of my videos. <laughs> um, this is the moon pool of the ship. Um, so I sailed on a ship for two months called the Joides Resolution. It's an ocean core drilling research ship that goes all around the world. And it um it is uh each expedition is very specific to whatever you know whatever mission the ship is going on. So I, that was a bad way of explaining it. So like previously yeah. beforehand, it went to like the caldera in uh, Santorini and that was very like volcano research. Right. So mm -hmm. my expedition was very astrobiology um, looking at this part of the world and taking core sampling. How many times did they uh, head out or have researchers, do you know, have they been out to the lost city? Is this since was the early 2000s when it when it was discovered yeah, so the, yeah the first cruise accidentally discovered it in 2000 then the nsf funded a huge follow-up to that um in it's either 2005 or 2008 i can't remember off the top of my head but so the nsf then funded a very big expedition to go back out um since then i know that you know some universities have funded to have some work done there and the joides resolution has been back there twice to my knowledge including my expedition the trick about going there is that it's very remote <laughs> um it is smack dab in the middle of the atlantic ocean um you are also pretty far away from any shipping lines i mean when i was out there we saw one ship <laughs> pass by um maybe two so you know you have to be able to have something that can sustain itself for at least a couple of weeks because it takes a while to get out there and so that video you saw of the moon pool that hole in the bottom of our ship is always open um, and that makes it possible to do what we do, but it also makes the ship move really slow. So I don't know like what this, <laughs> what the speed is to get there for a normal ship, but it took us like almost four days because we have to go very slow because of that hole. Um, but anyway, my point being, you know, you have to, it takes you a few days to get out there and then you want to be able to do at least two weeks of work, right? You know, it, it would be a complete waste to travel all that way and have to turn right around. So um, I don't know how many times how, it's been visited, but yeah. Yeah, I just saw that it's been, uh, they're not refunding it and the Joides Resolution missions aren't happening anymore. I'm sure there will be other missions to this area and the, the Joides will probably be replaced by other uh, research vessels and research missions. Um, but what was it? What was it like? I mean, the moon pole image with your your commentary about this hole that's in the <laughs> yeah. vessel that you're on. Um, it's it's a large hole, and it you is. watch the waves coming in and going out. And it, I like sailing. I <laughs> that was watching it. It's a, it's either mesmerizing or uh, it could really cause some <laughs> seasickness, some terror. Yeah. Some terror. <laughs> yeah, These are big waves. Yeah. Like you're you're not you're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. This is not near anything. So yeah. what was it like to be on the ship and to be exploring in that way? Yeah. No. I you know I get. Well, the first thing before I even left, everyone asked me, do you get seasick? Do you get seasick? I'm like, well, I don't, I scuba dive a lot and I go on boats and I never get mm -hmm. sick on those boats. So I don't know. I do get seasick. So uh, for the record, I do get slightly seasick, not very bad, but a little bit. Um, so that was, you know, kind of the first big experience was that movement heading out. It was just really weird. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, just that, that that movement. And then you kind of realize like, uh Oh, like, what did I get myself into? You know, <laughs> because you're heading out for two months 
And um, I better get used to this, get my sea legs. Yeah. But the yeah. nice thing about a ship like that is to be able to send this pipe miles down into the ocean floor, the ship has to be very, very stable. So once you get where you're drilling, there are 12 giant thrusters on the bottom of the ship and it will hold the ship in place. And then the captain will turn the ship to face the wind and the waves. So once you get where you need to go, it's not too bad. Um, some people are also very, very freaked out by the, like not being able to see land for two months. Uh, that didn't bother me, but I know that I've heard stories from other people that it has uh, like, I've heard even stories of other expeditions where people had to, they had to take the ship back to port because people were freaking out so much. Wow. Um, and luckily we, nobody, we never had any issues to that magnitude on my expedition. Um, it's, it's amazing. Ultimately it's really amazing because the ship runs 24 seven and then they have a, a paid staff that cooks all your meals. You can have your laundry done every single day. There's a gym. Um, I mean, it's kind of like cruising for science. <laughs> that does not sound like a terrible, a terrible experience. No, <laughs> not at all. I miss it so much. <laughs> um, but I also, I miss it, but I don't because there are so many moments where like on that expedition, it could not have gotten done sooner. You know, you just are just ready to be done. You're just ready to yeah. get off. You're ready to be done. And then you once can't. you're back. Yeah, yeah, but then you can't. Exactly. <laughs> um, so they make it as comfortable for you as possible for sure, which I really, really appreciated, but, uh, it, it's not for the faint of heart. And I've done an analog astronaut mission before this, where you get yeah. isolated for a couple of weeks. And I would say that was harder than the ship <laughs> in many ways, but it's still, it's not easy to be completely separated. You know, you can still call home, but yeah. it, it, there's definitely some mental strength you need to, to have, to be able to go out for two months. So you've scuba dived, you, you do scuba dive, uh, you've been on this two month long journey and you, you also, you, you let me know in the notes that you have climbed up to uh, the base camp on Mount Everest. Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like you are not averse to, uh, stressful or risky <laughs> torturing myself <yeah>. <laughs> experiences. <laughs> I wouldn't say that I've always uh, done everything with grace, <laughs> but <laughs> yes, um, I have stuck myself in some positions where I am like, mm, I don't know if this was the best choice, but here we are. <laughs> so yeah, I definitely am okay with very extreme environments um, in the sense of being okay with the level of danger that can sometimes mm -hmm. come with those things. I um, am actually working on a project now with my PhD that does research up in the Arctic. And I just got back from training for that very recently and listening to everybody else's stories about work in the field. I'm like, this might actually be the most intense thing that I'm going to be getting myself into if I do get to go out to the field, because um, even the equipment that they'll leave for just short amount of time. Uh, the bears will get to them. And so they're actually a very, like it's a very dangerous bear area to go up there. And it's I'm very like, dangerous. Oh. Yes. Yeah. So it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's my PI, um, Dr. Pash. And uh, yeah, we're working on basically mapping and we're using AI actually to help understand how the thawing of permafrost in that area is affecting the infrastructure and the roads and um, and then hopefully using mm -hmm. AI to predict if things continue on the track that it's going, how the roads will continue to break down um, right. and how, what we can do about it. <laughs> yeah. Are they going to remain or not? What's going to yeah. happen? I, Where are the sinkholes going to form? How are exactly. they going to break down? Yeah. 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 So, and there's also like some biological risks to all the permafrost going away so quickly up there too, because there were a lot of mass graves that were dug from like flu, you know, flu uh, epidemics and stuff. And those suddenly are getting exposed very quickly. And so there's even some looking into like, what, what are the implications to health for that happening? So it's a, it's a really cool project to be on just a, a, a completely different world than kind of what I've was doing on the ship in some ways because it's yeah. arctic um but i mean mount everest we know you know it, it can get extreme very cold the further uh, up in altitude you go there also also are 
um, you know, the deglaciation that's occurring as our atmosphere is warming is unearthing corpses and excrement. <laughs> yeah. People, you know, old food stores, old campsites, all sorts of things um, on mountains all around the world, not just uh, not just Mount Everest. But um, I hadn't I, I had cons considered the permafrost defrosting in terms of just natural microbes that are just in the soil or just are old and maybe yeah. get refreshed and come back to life because why not? They're just a right. bunch of DNA they, or RNA and they're they fine. Do like, what whatever. They're doing. Yeah. They're I very, just get to uh, sleep for a while. It's great. They're very smelly too. I got to, I got the chance to like, I know it sounds very weird, but like thawed permafrost liquid. Um, they're, they're doing lots of studies on it and it's, it's actually quite odiferous because <laughs> it's very old. And, uh, so, uh, I was at the Krell lab in, um, New Hampshire, which is the cold regions research lab. And they have a bunch of, you know, different samples and stuff like that. And, um, really cool, really cool science happening there. So anyway, yeah. It's like the, uh, the equivalent of geologists licking rocks. It's, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> permafrost yeah. scientists sniffing the, <laughs> the, 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 the thawed <laughs> permafrost. Yeah. Or, you know, paleontologists, I don't know if you know this, but you know, if you can tell something's a fossil, if you stick it to your tongue and it, and it sticks to your tongue just slightly because the little porous holes of the fossil will stick. So, right. <laughs> all out there. This is not, <laughs> do not this want thing. to tell people to go out and lick things in nature without knowing what you're doing. Yeah, but. Don't do this in the chemistry labs, but you know, maybe in nature, I don't know. Take your chances. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> yeah, lick a rock, lick a fossil. Lick the rock. <laughs> Sniff some permafrost. It's great. Yeah, we'll not? see if you get <laughs> How does that work out for you? But yeah, no, it's been, it's been an amazing ride. And, and so that's my, my current kind of thing, but my, my big thing from the ship is this lost city field. And yes, like you mentioned the book and the planetarium show and working wow. on that, um, is kind of ongoing on top of all this. Sounds like, yeah, you're doing a lot of communicating, but I, I really would like to know, uh, the, the graduate work. So this Arctic work that you're doing, it's the research and understanding what's happening there, but you are really engaged in communications. communications so yep. is, is your role in this going to be helping to communicate what the findings are or, uh, what are you, what is your goal? Yeah. Uh, what is my role? <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, and that, and that's happening. interesting. Um, and fun part for my job is it, there's two sides to that coin. One side is I do need to understand what's happening so I can communicate it properly. But then I also need to be a good communicator to a general audience because a lot of these projects that I work on have public funding. And it is the responsibility of these projects to communicate to the public what is happening because it is your dollars that are being spent on whatever they're doing. And um, there's a huge challenge in that because I could go up to you and say like, oh, I was at the Lost City hydrothermal field where serpentinization is happening and that's causing hydrocarbons to form and blah, blah, blah. And someone would be like, what? nothing. Why does right? that matter? Yeah. yeah you know, and, and, and it doesn't matter to them either. That, and that's the big challenge is um, and I challenge the the people that I work with because sometimes I have to interview people and ask them to explain their jobs to me. And I'm like, okay, but you need to tell me now, why does that matter to Sarah in Northern Illinois? You know, it, the Arctic is so far away and mm -hmm. most people here don't care. They don't know and they don't care and it doesn't affect their life. How does it affect their lives? And that pushes them to think about it more. And then it helps me do my job. <laughs> but, um, but that's but, really you, but it's it's a great role to be the person who's pushing the scientists to really get at like the nut of yeah. why it's important. Not just oh, I'm a scientist and I'm curious about this, but like why is it going to matter to other people? Exactly. Why does it why is it going to matter? And then it also brings them out of their I call it the curse of knowledge bubble because they're so ingrained in what they're doing, they kind of forget that like other people have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. And so, uh, yeah. you know, I try to always find equivalents that most people can understand. So like in my current project, um, we're, develop we're developing this platform that I would call kind of like a super science-y Google Earth. Like that is sort of the, the, the format when you launch into the platform, you can see the globe, you can see 
you know, Alaska, and then you can click on the map and you can go see LIDAR data. And so again, these are things that like LIDAR, I don't assume most people would know what LIDAR means versus radar. Um, and so I like that. I like that part of my job, but someone who works in LIDAR would be like, well, it's LIDAR, duh. Like you should just know that, you know? So I like breaking it down. And that's what I love doing as a science communicator is communicating science and then getting people really excited about it. Like there's a vent field in the middle of the Atlantic ocean. And it's the only one we have ever found on earth so far that works this way. And it was found on accident. And it was found on accident because of a broken <laughs> instrument too. They right. Yeah. And I think that it's just so cool and nobody knows of this thing. And so if I can get somebody excited, then I've done my job. Like that's, that's literally, <laughs> I've done my job. If you walk away and you're like, I like this weird vent field in the Atlantic ocean. I'm like, yep. I, I mean, the lost city, that, that name is, I oh, mean, yeah. it, it, it's reminiscent of something out of, you know, either Indiana Jones or something that's lost in the Amazon, you know, some culture like um, Atlantis or, you know, something like, yeah. The best part is no one, no one remembers who came up with the name too. <laughs> it's so funny. You're like, who came up with this? And they're like, I don't know. But I mean, that would be like that in itself is <laughs> right. It's a great story. I, and that, and that's what we're doing with this book project. We're trying to um, share the, the original stories and share the importance of the, of the research of that area, but put the human story into it because that is what people resonate with and what yeah. makes these places important and what matters. Um, and so that's what we're doing with that. And then what I'm hoping with this planetarium show then is to have a very visual high impact way of sharing this kind of science because what person doesn't just have their mind blown in a planetarium? I mean, and I, I love planetarium shows and it, to be able to go and experience a planetarium show that's going underwater and then potentially right. connects you to Space. Europa and Enceladus, you know, like, right. I know, fly, you know, the visualizations that can fry, fly you from, you know, these miles under the ocean to yep. thousands, millions of miles away from our yeah. own planet. This, this is great. Yeah. I'm yeah. looking forward to the day that I can like go to OMSI here in Portland and say, I, I know who did that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm super excited about that project and I'm really excited to bring it to my community because my community definitely needs all the, the help it can get with like supplemental STEM education initiatives. So that is a huge part of what I, I do as, as you can see, my name is space case, Sarah. So that's who I, I am as a science communicator in my, in my community. But, um, I, uh, yeah, I try to do as much outreach within my own community as possible. And it actually started with sidewalk astronomy. And so again, okay. going back to, mm -hmm. if I can just wow someone just a tiny little bit, right? Show them the moon and they're like, wow. I've never I, seen it like that. Yeah, I've done my job. I, I wish I could do that every day. Um, just wowing people with that and kids, especially if I can just give them that little bite and hook them. Because it's so unfortunate to me that so many children, um, especially in, in our community, the, the reading levels are, are, are shockingly low. And so the teachers mm -hmm. are just trying to get kids to read. They're just trying to get them up to par. So STEM falls pretty far down in, in the pile of education. And so then their first exposure are like textbooks, which are so bland. And so they have to cram as much as they can into these textbooks. Um, it's It's... It's almost criminal to me. So if I can, if I can next give thing, them, yeah, comic comic books or yeah. you know uh, adventure books that are you know something, like, yeah, something, something that sparks the kids imagine. into it. Yeah, exactly. Then I've done my job, and so yeah, yeah. it's been it's 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 a it's a wild journey, <laughs> but the whole th the thread of it all has been communicating science. Do you think that you will continue in the, the space-based direction or, um, you know, kind of as that through line of biology, yeah. chemistry here on Earth and where that leads into the universe? Yeah, I definitely want to um, continue the thread. And I, I look, I actively look for ways to see how what I'm doing, even if it might not seem like it's super linked, um, 
connect it to astrobiology because again, to me, astrobiology is just, it's all the sciences. And I like to always tell people, earth is a part of space. Like we are on spaceship earth and it is, it is no different here than it is out there. And so we're not, we're not as separated as we kind of feel that we are, that's earth and space. Like we're all a part we're of We're part of it. Big thing. Right. Yeah. And, um, so like my, my work in the Arctic, I can already see sort of connecting points to this extreme cold weather. Cause that's a huge part of what we're also looking at is, uh, it's very hard to keep drones <laughs> and batteries going in extreme cold. And those are challenges that NASA is going to face sending things to these icy moons. Um, it's the same issues. Uh, if you can keep an electric vehicle running in right. sub-zero temperatures, then maybe you can keep a robot drone on. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and, then, and then kind of linking back to some of the science stories yeah. that we were talking about earlier. But right. There are microbes that have evolved to live in these extreme cold environments. And yeah. so there are. There are scientists looking at the biology of how that works and how can we implement that biology into our technology to keep these things from basically malfunctioning because they freeze over. <laughs> right. Yeah. How do we keep that? How do we keep that chemical en energy producing either enough heat or just enough momentum chemically to maintain reactions? So right. That, exactly. So that yeah. our our technology works, so that our investigations work so all of it works yeah it's all connected to me i see it it's to you um, yes. to me. I I see it. I the universe. Have, yeah <laughs> some of the scientists still have a very like i'm a geologist i don't do space stuff you know and i'm i you know we're all on the same team team earth okay yeah team right, right now team earth team life let's keep keep it going here on our yeah. planet and figure out how to live here better while we figure out how Others, how, it, other all works, how yeah. it all works around us, right? Yeah, Where do exactly. we fit in the exactly. giant scheme of things? Yes. Well, that's getting very philosophical, but yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was almost going to go there with the muscles thing too. You know, if a robot showed up on earth from another planet and it had muscles that had like cells, would we consider that life visiting earth? I would. Would you? I mean, okay. but it's a robot. But at the same right. time, yes. I mean, right. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. Would that be? This is a really great question. I love this. <laughs> I'm gonna let. I'm gonna go ask my son about this later and get like, him. Would to that be? It. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole concept of if an if a robot in general visited, would it be when, considered life? Because right. When is us. when is artificial intelligence, general artificial intelligence, considered intelligent enough to be conscious, uh, to and have enough visiting. awareness? Yeah sentience, sapience, et cetera, versus, right. I don't know. Yeah. And then there's also, a Life has to be heritable. According to our definitions, there have to be mechanisms for heritability and for uh, reproducibility right. and for sustainability. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. That's um, what also astrobiology deals with too. There's definitely a whole philosophical policy making side of it too, where say we go to Europa and we find life. What does that mean? And how, what does, you know, how do we, how do we handle we, that? It means we sent a craft there that probably has microbes from earth on it. It's and probably, we, just, yeah, <laughs> we just contaminated it. We probably <laughs> contaminated it. Right. But yeah. you know, there's a whole, a whole slew of ethics. That's why NASA has a, a category rating of different planets and like how at risk it is to yes, pollute it with our own yep. oopsies. And so, uh, like the moon is a zero because we know nothing could live on the moon. So even though certain it's also close and maybe we're like, eh, we just kind of want to go. Yeah. <laughs> well, that too. But, you know, I, I don't remember it was a few years back, some, some spacecraft crashed and there were a bunch of tardy grades on it. And, you know, that is like, oops, but it's not going to probably mess anything up because it's not really, you know. And that's the, not that's great, the question. But... <laughs> People would love to think that those tardigrades are just having a party on the moon, but I think they are. But yeah. it's know. a tardy party. <laughs> <laughs> Someone needs to make that into a shirt now. <laughs> ah, I think oh, that would be great. I, I I don't know anybody out there and who is who's in our audience. Take it and run with it. Sarah, I don't want to keep you too late because I know uh, it is a late night for you where you are. And 
really enjoying talking with you about your work and the things that you've been involved in. Is there anything else that you want to just touch on before mm. we head out for the night? I don't think so, but thank you so much for, for having me. And I, I know I feel like there, that there's so much that I like, I feel like I just skimmed the surface of every little topic and then I'm like, but wait, there's so much more, but you can, uh, you can definitely find my work and, and me online as spacecasera.com. Um, and I'm on all the, as people would say, time wasting platforms. Um, so <laughs> I'm sure I, you're not wasting any time there. All the time. Just, wasting it's time. all the work, <laughs> yeah. but, um, you know, I like to, to share pictures and, um, share memories still of especially the ship because I, I haven't even it hasn't even been a year since I was on it so it's still pretty fresh you know like even some of the people I sailed with they work full time year round on the ship but they go two months on two months off so like that crew is back on the ship so it's still like very like ugh, like I'll have these moments where I'm like I just need to share a video because I miss it so much <laughs> um but uh, I, yes, I need Eric, to go it, back to the seasickness. Yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> I think I, I figured out kind of my trick for the seasickness. Uh, it's definitely, you know, that's all an inner ear thing. So if you're working on a laptop and your world is moving around you, but you're looking at something stable, your brain is like, Burr! like, I do not understand why I feel like we are moving. So it basically was like, I cannot work today. I just, I can't, yeah. you know, I would just have to go outside and. And I figured it out, but find the horizon. So yes. You get your brain and your inner ear and the visual the system horizon. and the yes, the yes. That was a huge thing. Yes. Um they could all work together. Yeah. <laughs> but it's yeah, like car yeah. sickness. That's why you have people sit in the front seat of the car or be the driver so that they have like the proprioception and the vision that works with the inner ear stuff to make it all work together. Yeah. If you have car sickness. Yeah, some people anyway. were really bad. And we also had a hospital on board with a doctor that could give you some mild drugs and then really, really heavy duty drugs if you really struggled. So <laughs> um, there's only so much that Dramamine can do after a while. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Billy, who is uh, one of my co author on the book that I'm working on, he was, he basically was like, Yep, you're not going to see me for 48 hours because <laughs> I am going well, to be laying down. And he's, and I'm like, he's like, I don't know how I ended up in this line of work because he specializes in studying the lost city. So he's always going out in the ocean. It's like, ooh, you picked a bad thing to focus your research he's on. It's like, but... yeah, just give me a minute. <laughs> 48 hours or so, uh, then I'll be okay for a while. I might have right. to go back down again, but we're good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm used to it. It's all it's just, just the way it is. All right. <laughs> um, Eric Knapp does live in Alaska. He's saying oh. the most important thing okay. in going to the Arctic. Clean Eric, where do you live in, in Alaska? But anyway, yeah, no, uh, clean, dry socks. I would agree. Um, Just about anywhere. I've anywhere. been reading a book called The Comfort Crisis, and it's um, the author. He goes up in Alaska and does like a, a month-long hunting expedition kind of thing like that. And um, yes, he gives lots of suggestions of like boots and gear and stuff. And I'm like taking notes like, okay. I should probably remember that. I am such a wimp for the cold too. I would much rather be somewhere warm and diving, but here we are. So, and you live I wouldn't in be diving. I just like warm places. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Try diving. It's so fun. I don't know. I've, I've snorkeled. That was about as much as I could do. <laughs> but, <Aww>. I've been <laughs> diving. I, like, I, I like videos. I like okay. the, I like looking at what other people do. It okay. Makes me happy. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I, as you said, your website is spacecasesarah.com, Sarah Treadwell. I expect that we are going to be seeing some uh, really incredible stuff from you in the future, and I can't wait. And I hope that we stay in touch and are able to find out more about your adventures and your communications work because it's good thank stuff. You. Yeah, it is. It's just pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> Sometimes I'm not even like sure that this is my own life. I'm like, who? Like, you what? <laughs> Me? Yeah. It's adventure, Sarah. There we are. Yes, it's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so everyone out there, um, I mean, Sarah, once again, short notice, and I appreciate you being here tonight so much. And it's just been a wonderful conversation. And um, I hope everyone 
else who listened in and was here during the show appreciates it. I hope everyone who catches it as, as a podcast also enjoys the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening, everyone. And I do have some shout outs for people who help the show on a weekly basis. Fada, thank you for your work on show notes and the social media. Gord, Arnlor, others, thank you for helping out in the chat rooms and keeping everything happy. Our discords, our YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook chat rooms. Thank you, everybody who was here live and chatting in the chat room. Uh, Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And Rachel, thank you for your amazing assistance in editing the show. And of course, I must now thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Aaron Anathema, Arthur Kepler, Craig Potts, Mary Garrett, Teresa Smith, Richard Badge, Bob Coles, Kent Northcote, Rick Gloveman, George Chorus, Pierre Belazarp, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Chris Wozniak, Vegard Chefstad, Jonathan Stiles, a.k.a. John Stylo, Ali Coffin, Reagan Shubru, Sarah Forfar, Don Mundus, P.I.G., Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myjax, Andrew Swanson at Fredus 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Kesson Blow, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin. Richard, Brendy, Brendan Minish, Johnny Ridley, Remy Day, G. Burton Lattimore, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramis, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, Lawn Makes, EO, Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul D. Disney, David Simmerly, and Patrick Pecoraro, and Tony Steele. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. Did you breathe? Any, <laughs> barely, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to be like the uh, old school, what is it, the little matchbox machines. Anyway, <laughs> micro machines, the little cars. Oh, if anyone else is interested in supporting us on Patreon, please head over to twist.org where you can find a link to our Patreon page. Next week on the show, Justin should be back with us, I think. I don't know. Don't miss it. You don't know what's going to happen. I don't either. We'll be back. I will for sure be back broadcasting Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. And if you want to listen to us as a podcast, of course, just look for This Week in Science, all places that podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe too. And if you have any need for more information or links or anything that, any of the things that Sarah and I talked about tonight, Again, our show notes are on twist.org. And there is also, uh, you can put your email in and subscribe to our newsletter if you want to. That's all there at our website. You can email us as well. My email is kirsten at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. Justin is twistminion at gmail.com. And Blair is blairbaz at twist.org. Don't forget to put twists in the subject line so your email doesn't get spam filtered into the lost city. <laughs> Hydrothermal vents where, you know, it's lost. I, they, they kind of found I it. I will find it. An it. Yeah. <laughs> I know that place <laughs> now. I have all the maps. So <laughs> you tell me, I'll find it. I'll tell you. <laughs> Oh my goodness. You can find us on social media. We're still out there at Twist Science is the, the main account. My account is at Dr. Kiki. Justin is at Jackson Fly. Blair's, Blair is Blair's Menagerie. And Sarah, what is your usual socials? Oh, I, I'm Space K Sarah everywhere. Every really? single time wasting platform you type Space K Sarah, you shall find me as such. Wonderful. If anyone also wants to request a topic or an interview that we might do, someone like Sarah to guest on the show, let us know. We love your feedback. And we will be back. Twists will be back here next week. And we hope that you will join us again for more great science news. And of course, if you did learn anything on the show tonight, remember, it's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in 
science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. Oh my goodness. We are now in the after show. Sarah, I haven't ended the stream yet, so we're still live, but I do want to, you know, give you the opportunity to, you know, say goodnight again or whatever and just say. Thank you to everyone who listened. And I'm, you know, I always feel very like, man, I probably was ping ponging all over the place, but that's because like I have so much I could share that I have a hard time landing on like, okay, this is the right thing because then it's beep, 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 you know, just. No, I mean, but you're doing, you're doing really interesting work. And the, you know, it, even though, uh, you know, your current research work is in one area and you've done something in the past and you've got these long-term projects that are ongoing, you know, you've definitely got this passion for understanding stuff and helping to share it. And it was just, yeah. Great to, yeah. Great to have your company tonight. And you're, well, I'm so glad I was able to help you out tonight too. And yeah, no, I, uh, you know, would love to come back, especially, you know, the love book project was kind of, like I said, not, not known, but that is going to be more formally announced probably as we get a little bit closer to maybe pitching to a publisher. But then I also have right. like, you know, other things that like, I'm, I'm always kind of brewing things and I'm always waiting for yays, nays, the right time to share things. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I'm not, not saying that I kind of threw out something for the Antarctic, but I maybe do. So, you know, anyway, if I have like, other You're like, let me go to all the extreme up. places. <laughs> um, Next yeah. thing I know, you're going to be in the Arctic, Antarctic, and then you'll be on the moon. I, or Mars, right. You know, like if you would have asked me two years ago to, do you want to go to space? I would have been like, oh, no way. Like that just, it didn't seem very feasible. And now I'm like, Oh, I feel like a suborbital hop kind of thing could be in my in my path at some point someday. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I mean, if I can convince you also to, you know, scuba dive. I'm no, <laughs> just kidding. But I'll be in Fiji in May diving. So that is also just a really cool part of the story is just it's all, you know, seeing the whole world. It's so cool. The world is so cool. It's so amazing. It's so beautiful. And it's so epic to get to just explore all these parts of it. So anyway, I'm done gushing. <laughs> I love that you are out there exploring and taking yeah. advantage of uh, being able to do that and, you know, going places that maybe some people cannot go so that you can come back and share that joy, share the awe and the wonder and the understanding that's being gained. Um, you know, it's, you know, it, it is a privilege to be able to go and do all these things, but then it's like, the fact that you are also, you know, you want to share it with others as well as, you know, that's, and you want yeah. to be good at sharing it with others. <laughs> good. <laughs> I want to, I want to share also because I want people to, I, I think that, and we didn't even touch base on this at all, but um, yeah. one of the reasons I got into science communication was because I was in a very scary car accident, a mm. very kind of holy crap, that could have been it moment. And that was a huge wake up call for me to be like, man, like I have this, as far as I understand, one precious life and I want Mm -hmm. to take full advantage of it. And as also being a mom, I want to show my children that this is how one way you can live a very full, big, purposeful life. And, um, you know, how do we encourage our children any better than doing it by leading it by example. So I don't know who this person is, but they said, I've never left the closet. Well, you know what? Your backyard is a good start. That's great. And um, You you do whatever makes you comfortable. Little steps. Exactly. Baby steps. Depending on where you live, you could probably even like in my area, you can even find fossils in your backyard. You can find, you know, little, Ammonite kind of fossils and stuff. Here in Oregon, we can uh, you can go out and they what are they? It's not dragon eggs. It's um, but it's the it's the geodes. So you can go out oh, and you yeah. can have, Ooh, because it's fine. so much volcanic uh, area. There's so many volcanic geological areas. You can go out and thunder eggs. Is that what I think that might be the common? No, I, don't know. Something I, like I just didn't know them as geodes. So I don't know. <laughs> geodes, but you find you can find the rocks and they're kind of the, you know, these round 
ugly things and you can crack them open and then they're I there. know they're so fun mm -hmm. but yeah beautiful geodes inside all thanks to chemistry yes it's it you know what i have i'm gonna ask you really quick a question biology mm. or chemistry like what maybe not even those two I always argue that chemistry is like, that's the base, right? You need to, but then people will push back on me and they're like, no, it's physics or something. What mm. do you think? I think it's physics because okay. physics at the uh, subatomic scale is what allows us to have the chemistry that then builds uh, to create yeah. life. Like you're, and so it's like it's like and blah, 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 blah. even be you know quarks and gluons and you know right. the and and the physics of it comes down to you know I'm not even going to go into the quantum space, <laughs> <Not anymore. laughs> um, but even just you know the the interactions between um, electrons and uh, other. You, know, you have hydrogen ions and you have calcium ions, you know, how do these different things come together and how do, you know, organic chemistry, uh, whatever. Okay. Organic, organic chemistry. That's what is building life, but it doesn't happen unless you have the underlying interactions at the electromagnetic scale. So I like that answer. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. So I, I, I have thought about this many times, but I, you know, no one is more important than any other. They're too they're interconnected. I would agree. That. Yeah. yeah. You can't quite separate them when you're like, which one's the most important that you need to know? It's and, kind of hard. And that's when like when people who are physicists, they're like, oh, you know, I'm going to come up with a theory of everything and it's going to explain biology and ecosystems and how that all works. And I'm like, no, you're not. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. And that's what I I love, that's what I love. And this is for the really dedicated after, after show people here um, that we also didn't get into, but I was raised a uh, young earth creationist. And in those environments, you have the answers. It's just, you know, and if it's too complicated, then it can get easily explained away as like, oh, it's a mystery. It was just made to look that way. And um, I find so much liberation in not having answers. I think it's fantastic. And that's why... Uh, yeah, like sub subatomic particle physics kind of stuff is so weird, right? Like how do electrons disappear for a hot whatever and then come back? Like, where do they go? I love that we don't know. And then you talk about no, neutrinos and they're flipping into different kinds of neutrinos and they're like, I'm going to be this one and that one. And like, right? I love it. And then like the, the double slit experiment is like my favorite one purely for the like, why does it do that? We don't know, really. No. We don't really know. And I find like, it. it's so freeing <laughs> to just be like, hmm, we don't know. Because it's so opposite of what I was taught and raised in, where it was like, we have all the answers. We know what we're doing. We're right. And now it's like, we don't know. And that's really cool, right? Yeah. One of the, uh, so not uh, young earth, but flat earth, which was mm -hmm. a conspiracy theory that was a false flag movement on social media by propagandists. And anyway, I'm not going to go into the politics of where it all came from initially, but it's an interesting history if you ever want to dig into where the flat earth ideas came from, really. Um, but there are many, I mean, often you'll run into people who maybe think about that and they, and they believe in the flat earth. And I read an article in Wired that someone shared recently written by a professor and he's a science writer also. He writes about physics stuff, but he was like, oh, here are two like foolproof experiments and ways to convince your flat earth friends that they that the earth is round or spherical or oblate, right. sphere, whatever. <laughs> it was just, it was like, here's the, this is, it was, here's the knowledge, here's the information, here's an experiment, now you have to believe me kind of attitude right, right. as opposed to approaching a person and trying to figure out why they th they agree or they believe in the flat earth idea in the first place. Where are they coming from? Like, right. As opposed to addressing it with inqu inquiry and then leading to conversation, it was basically like how to win an argument with your flat earther friends. And <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that really is. Yeah. I even struggle with that a lot too, because it does feel like you want to win an argument, but um, 
a science communicator friend of mine that I very much look up to. Actually, I'm wearing her sweatshirt tonight. It says it's Ad Astra for Astra, oh, Emily nice. Calandrelli. Yeah, um, she's but, great. Yeah, and she's originally she's from West Virginia. And so she always um, talks about how you can't blaze into that state and tell these people that, you know, co burning coal is bad because that just that's not going to work. Um, and that's people's livelihoods. They're exactly. generational. Right. So <laughs> livelihoods. That's yeah. a huge thing. I uh, People are, you know, I'm kind of feeling the pressure of like, what's your dissertation going to be? And I'm like, I don't know. But one of the things I am juggling <laughs> a lot about is that 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 exactly what we're talking about is how do we have better conversations in these spaces where people have very, very different backgrounds and different ideas. Um, and I think that what's really unfortunate is that <clears throat> you see these people also becoming our politicians and our leaders. And so when we have these flip-flops of parties, then suddenly NASA missions are completely cut. And um, Or if a, if a politician actually follows the science and the scientific information changes, suddenly they're a flip-flopper. Right, and they're not yeah. Stand, you know. <laughs> right, exactly. So like, how do we have better, how do we yeah. have better conversations at these decision making levels too? Because we, you know, it's just so unfortunate to see things being built up for years. And then suddenly it's like, nope, never mind. We're cutting that. And you're like, there goes like someone's work down the train. So anyway, yeah. I will stop rambling and let you there, go as well. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so much to dig, dig into right there, but, um, I think you're on the right track. I think you have the right background for it. I think, you know, your experiences working with scientists right now, trying to help them get to the heart of why it matters is important. And, um, and then also that understanding, you know, where is it for different people in different places and why do different things matter to different groups? And how do you tell someone in West Virginia or in Illinois to care about a hydrothermal plane, you know, this <laughs> right. area in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you know, why there? Or even Europa. It has no relevancy to them. And and some people, they just won't. It won't. And I'm totally fine with that. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I have to think about this as a communicator. So, yep. yeah. Yep. I, I know where you're coming from. <laughs> Cannot wait to see uh, what you do next and to find out more about the work yeah. that you're doing. I look forward. I look forward. Yeah. Awesome. I want to know Thank more you. about the lost city. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you'll, yeah. That's, it's going to be my life for like the next year. So yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. And thank yeah. you to anyone still lingering. It's weird not to be able to, I usually, ha I'm when I Get host. In the control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't see like, is anyone even there anymore? So, um, but yeah. yes, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. It's just amazing to get to talk to you once again. And for everyone out there, one more reminder, Sarah Treadwell. You can look for her Space Case Sarah online, all the things, spacecasesarah.com or the uh, socials or whatever. This has been This Week in Science. We'll be back again next week. Appreciate your time. And I do hope that you all don't forget to ask questions. But stay safe. Don't lick too many rocks. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know. I think you should. Just, just go for it. Stay Live healthy. Dangerously. Yeah. Lick the yeah. weird rock. <laughs> and this is where, uh, stay lucky. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next week. Good night. Bye. <laughs>